Hello, everyone. This is Maz. So just before we get to this next episode with the incredible John Spencer, a few short remarks. I've reached out to John to speak with him about the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Given this extensive experience, especially in understanding the complexities of urban warfare, coupled with his daily engagement with people on the ground, I can think of no better person than John to shed some light on both the current situation as well as how we got to where we are. Some of the key questions that John answers is firstly his assessment of the current state of affairs. We then delve into why urban warfare is so difficult, and to make his point, John uses the Battle of Kiev that occurred during the first days of the invasion. As many of you will know, John visited Ukraine in June, so his insights are as contemporary as they can be. This led to a broader discussion about the reasons why Ukraine was able to withstand the initial Russian assault. It is not an exaggeration to say that everyday citizens, and not just the military, saved Ukraine in those first few days. There's a key lesson here that we discuss at length, and that is the importance of understanding the human terrain. In other words, understanding how a population within a given context is likely to respond to aggression is absolutely critical. We also talked extensively about the power of narrative and how, when fused with modern communications, it can have a decisive impact. We discussed how the Ukrainian ability to connect to their citizens instantaneously helped galvanize resistance. Here we also discussed the birth and impact of John's mini-manual for the urban warfighter. Towards the end, we talked about a number of key lessons to be taken away, possible directions of this war, as well as its impact on broader geopolitical tensions. All in all, as you will hear, this was a wide-ranging discussion, and you'll be left in no doubt of John's credibility and depth of knowledge. As always, I encourage you to share the episode and discuss any points of interest, either publicly or by reaching out directly. So, without any further delay, I hope you enjoyed this important discussion. My guest today is John Spencer. And if you haven't heard of this man, you've probably been living under a rock. He's an award-winning scholar, professor, author, combat veteran, an internationally recognized expert and advisor on urban warfare and other military-related topics. He has served as an advisor to the top four-star general and other senior re- leaders in the U.S. Army as part of strategic research groups from the Pentagon to the United States Military Academy. John also has over 25 years in the active army as an infantry soldier and has held ranks from private to major. He has conducted two combat deployments to Iraq as an infantry platoon leader and a company commander. John currently serves as the chair of urban warfare studies with the Madison Policy Forum and was until recently the chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point. He's also the co-director of the Urban Warfare Project and host of the Urban Warfare Project podcast. John is also the author of the Mini Manual for the Urban Defender, which is a short compilation of John's vast experience, and there are currently over 100,000 copies of the manual in Ukraine, where it's being used daily by the defenders. As many of you already know, John has been a prominent commentator on the ongoing invasion of Ukraine and features daily in the mainstream and social media. John joins me today to talk about all things Ukraine, realities of urban warfare, as well as lessons we can draw from this war. John, it's a pleasure to host you on The Voices of War. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be on it. I know our time is short, but I do have to ask a little uh, about your background. How did you end up being the urban warfare expert uh, that you are and, and what path led to this? Yeah, well, thanks. And that's uh, I'll try to be brief on that question. So I joined the Army what seems like a long time ago as a, as a private straight out of our high school. He started off enlisted and went to Sergeant First Class, mm-hmm. uh, switched over to become an officer. As soon as I became you an came officer- came over to the dark side. <laughs> I did. I did. And it seems as soon as I did that, within months, I was jumping into Iraq, a part of the 2003 invasion right. with the, the paratroopers. And most of that tour was urban, right? So we we moved our way down to Kirkuk uh, and then spent an amazing year with the formations. I came back, went to college, was a ranger instructor, which was pivotal in my career for our, our ranger school. Mm. And then I really went from being straight from being a ranger instructor at a ranger school to back into combat into Baghdad this time in 2008, where I was a company commander. Mm in Baghdad, in all urban, uh, actually during yeah. a big battle called the Battle of Sadr City, really at the height of the, the insurgency. So a lot of tough fights, a lot of tough problem sets that were were mostly urban. And, mm. and I've written about some of those those moments. 
So I came back and I went into a, a fellowship program where I went to Georgetown to get my master's, but I mm-hmm. also spent two years in the Pentagon, uh, one year on the joint staff, one on the army staff, and then had an amazing opportunity, which really, I think where urban started, although you know, there's urban experience in, mm-hmm. in combat, but academically in 2014, I, I was assigned to the chief of staff of the army strategic studies group. Mm-hmm. So like 20 people that were hand selected to be like a think tank for the oh, for wow. our head, head general. And for over a year, we studied one thing. We studied how the U.S. Army was prepared to fight and operate in mega cities. So cities over right. 10 million people. Yeah. So I learned a lot. Well, I learned a lot about research, but I learned a lot about gaps in preparing for urban operations because I tr- really try to cover the whole gamut. Mm. So I did that year, we, an amazing report. I was a part of really looking at how you design armies for urban operations. Oh, wow. Yeah. Moved to West Point as an assignment to be an instructor there, instructor of tactics and then eventually strategy. Um, And then I was asked to help stand up a research center, the Modern War Institute. Mm. And that's when I started writing about it, urban. So I wrote one article about how we use concrete in Iraq, which most probably a lot of your listeners understand that we use Mm. concrete to achieve a great variety of objectives to include offensively in the Battle of Sire City. Mm. That article went viral. So then I was basically hooked. And then I just started studying, yeah. started presenting. So that, that really was 2014 until I retired in 2018. I'd already started publishing lots on urban warfare at that point. But then in 2018, I was I retired from the military, but then was stayed on with the Modern War Institute as the, the chair of urban warfare studies, mm. which technically I'm still I am the chair. Well, not technically. I am still the chair of urban warfare studies. It's just if I'm talking about Ukraine, there's some some distance that has to be done with you know with a government institution that had to make and so that's why you've yeah. seen the uh the, the chair uh, of, yeah yeah <laughs> the bio and, uh reads as it does <laughs> that's all right that's right yeah so i stayed on and then i for i had a dream job now mm. i traveled the world so i go into combat zones i got back from ukraine two months ago mm. last year i went into nagarna karabakh to study the battle of mm. susha so mm. i, I travel the world looking at battles uh, talking to militaries, teaching militaries. We even put together a course in California to teach all militaries on how to plan for urban operations. I consider myself a student of urban operations. So, cause I learn something every day. I think, you mm-hmm. know, learning is living, um, but just had a, this, now I have this dream job to only focus on one aspect of war. And as you know, I, I know, you know, but I mean, you're talking about war. It's such a big arena mm-hmm. and I get to, just focus on fighting in urban areas mm. and not just fighting, but, you know, planning operations, everything from understanding cities, from global cities to feral cities, to smart cities, mm. down to how do you take down a building with, you know, a mix of civilians and enemy inside of it. Mm. I have the dream job. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a dream job for somebody that's military minded like yourself. I, I can absolutely see that. I think uh, many of my audience would freak out at the thought of uh, <laughs> of, uh, of studying the urban environment, uh, which is perhaps a good pivot to talk about a, before we launch into Ukraine about urban warfare as a concept. I know you've publicly said that you know you consider it to be one of the hardest, if not the hardest, or environments that we fight in. Why do you say that? Yeah. So I actually have a, a lecture I give on just some why it's the hardest. Cause I've actually had to argue against other academics that, you know, fighting in high mountainous terrain mm, is hard. Mm, fighting jungle, in jungles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Which was my first duty station. I was a private in the jungle of Panama. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It really yeah. hard, but hard is in definition of trying to achieve a military objective. So one, we have to define urban warfare. So urban warfare can along the scale of full of military operation can be literally urban policing up mm. to high intensity urban combat. Mm. Um, and I cover the full gamut. I, I interview police chiefs and I talk about, you know, major mm. battles of World War II and do case studies on, on World War II. Now, why it's the hardest? Because unlike any other terrain on the planet, by definition, urban means that there is a lot of physical buildup, you know, concrete mm. buildings. Mm. And um, that's the physical three-dimensional terrain, right? So underground, surface, and super surface, right? Rooftops and mm. you know, all mm. these things that make seeing into the into the environment really hard, right? Mm. If you're attacking into urban terrain, just the one element of physical terrain makes it really hard, especially the way the militaries are designed today with the use of fires and superior ISR or intelligence mm. surveillance reconnaissance. Mm. The urban terrain 
unlike other trains, it's really, you can't see through concrete. Mm. It makes it really hard. Number mm. two, which surely should be number one, is that by definition, urban means that there's a population there, mm. lots of people. So just if you empty a city and just have a lot of buildings, it's not urban. It, mm. It's just it's just mm. urban terrain, but it's not urban. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Once you have the presence of people, trying to achieve a military terrain is harder than any other environment, right? There's no people in the jungle, although there's some, but right, where mm, the yeah, people yeah, are yeah. a prominent part of the environment. So that means under laws of war, you're going to have restrictions on the use of force. You're not just going to do whatever you want. Um, you're well, going it depends to on have, who I, I guess, <laughs> which, yeah. which we'll get to. Yeah, <laughs> We'll get to. Yeah. Yes. There are going to be restrictions on the use of force, right? Protected populations, protected places, things you shouldn't shoot at. The intermixing of bad and, and protected. I mean, it just it literally makes it the hardest to fight in because of these type of the environment you're going in there. And the infrastructure, right? So the second and third order effects of military operations are easier to determine in other environments, all other environments. I don't care if it's space to, mm. to Arctic, but civilian infrastructure, second and third order effects, but also the global connectedness of that infrastructure, right? So economic or just you know, the commodities, most major cities are connected either locally, regionally, theater, globally. So when you do a military operation in there, calculating that second order effect is very hard to determine. Mm. So again, hardest, unlike mm. other. And then lastly, you know, I could go on, but information, right? You mentioned it, information operations. If it's truly urban terrain and you have this global connected environment with millions of people in it, with millions of cell phones and millions of cameras and sensors, the implications on the other populations that are in war right war means that there's three populations there's the military fighting the war mm. there's the politicians or the political governments that sent them to do the job and then you have the populations in which support both entities so in information environments can impact all three of those and we've seen mm. that in the war right so you think you're going to go in there and just blow everything you well yeah. now the politicians say stop and now your population say they stop altogether. Like, you know, why are you even there? Mm. So that information domain within the urban environment is unlike any other terrain. Um, and we've seen that today on the modern battlefield. It's even more than I, I can predict that mm. the implications mm. of the information domain in urban environments are going to impact tactical to strategic operations. Mm. So again, making it the hardest place on the planet you could ask militaries to conduct operations. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and we'll get to a couple of those points in some more detail because I think they're so spot on. But maybe we can pivot now to Ukraine to get us to that point because I think Ukraine is 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 a horrible, real, current case study of everything that you're talking about. But maybe just firstly, given how tapped in you are into daily commentary on or the state of the, the war, what is happening at the moment? Where are we in this war at the moment and how do you see it? I know even yourself, you've made some comments and many other prominent commentators are making comments that we might be seeing a possible shift in momentum. Do you agree with that? And where are you seeing this? Yeah, well, one, I absolutely agree with that. And we say initiative or is kind of a, a term in military speaking, you know, who has the initiative. Mm -hmm. and, and matter of fact, from the operational down to the tactical, you're always trying to gain and maintain the initiative, right? Yeah. And I agree, yeah. momentum is is what it is. Right. So in the war today, as we're talking in Ukraine, we're in this second phase of the war. Right. So Russia was defeated back in April of this year in achieving their strategic goals. Always judge a battle or a war based on the strategic goals of both sides. Mm. Russia had a stated goal of regime change in Ukraine, wanted to do away with Ukraine as a country. They had to take out the government, put in a puppet government and, and call it Russia. They failed that. They failed in the Battle of Kiev. I know we'll talk about that. Mm. So in this new phase, Russia's stated goal is to secure the Donbass, and you can add in southern Ukraine in that. Mm. And at the really at the onset of this shift in in really April May timeframe, mm -hmm. it seemed that Russia had the momentum. It was taking, it had shifted all its forces and reconstituted, reorganizes a lot of their forces, and were really pushing hard into Donbass, and had mass because they do outnumber mm. the Ukrainians. Mm. 
And then, you know, in June, we start to see big battles like the Battle of Severa Donetsk, where Russia is taking ground and, and can't mm. be stopped. Mm. Um, although it, they were stopped in taking Kharkiv, which was a pivotal battle. Yeah, yeah. This is where we're at. We're in the second phase of this major war for Ukraine, but in now for stopping Russia from achieving its goal of just rapidly taking mm. the Donbass in southern Ukraine. But what we've seen over the last month or so is that you know, because of the flow of Western weapons, because of the smart fighting the Ukraine has done, which is pull back when needed to mm. destroy, you know, take advantage of your enemy's mistakes. Trade space for time, as we've seen in That's the, right. in the space, East. space yeah. for time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and destroy, you know, up to U.S. estimates are now up to 80,000 Russian casualties. Nobody has the exact number of Ukrainians, but it's much, much less. Uh, and so now you see. Ukrainians possibly conducting their first offensive operation against the southern city of Harrison, mm. where they've worked for weeks to isolate the city, right? This is urban warfare. Isolate the city from possible reinforcement, resupply um, by taking out the major logistics supplies. Mm. What's interesting about Ukraine is that it proves what I've had to argue, literally argue in debates that urban warfare is important. Mm. And all roads lead to urban, but to achieve Either of Russia's stated strategic objectives, they had to take and control urban terrain. Either they mm. had to take key, yeah. had yeah. to penetrate it, or now they have to take the major cities into Donbass, right? As soon as the Donbass offensive happened, like, they, okay, if you want to take the Donbass, you got to take the urban areas because they are the logistical hubs and the mm. centers of, of power, ultimately. Yeah. Power, our, yeah. All yeah, yeah. forms of power, right? There's four, four forms of power. Sorry, this feels like an, an important uh, kind of lesson to take note. What are the four forms of power that, you, <laughs> that you're talking about? Sure. So we teach in from a mm -hmm. nation state, there's four forms of power, right? It's called dime, mm -hmm. diplomatic, information, military, and economic. Uh, cities are the economic engines of nations. They're also the seat of political power. They're the source of inf informational reach. So this idea that armies colliding in the folded gap in the open areas is gone. Mm -hmm. You know, some people that I respect, like Anthony Bieber, who says the idea of massive maneuver warfare on the open plane is dead. Mm -hmm. Like one, mm -hmm. that's dumb on the modern battlefield to fight like that in giant fronts in the open. It's just dumb mm -hmm. uh, because we have mm -hmm. enough technology that I'll just erase you from the battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, so when when Ukraine kicked off, there were people who are still stuck in that maneuverist enemy centric mindset who said, you know, go out and meet the Russian mm. army on the field of battle and destroy yeah. the Russian military, which, well, that would have been the dumbest thing Ukraine could have done. Yeah. So Ukraine smartly defended their urban train and let the Russians defeat themselves smashing up against yeah. defenses. Yeah. It's also the only reasonable defense mechanism to have. I mean, it's uh, we've seen, I mean, even Gulf War one is a perfect example of what happens if a military hits a military, the more, technologically advanced and the more i guess uh the better connected military the advantage is just it's decisive yeah hey, even in uh you know, the second gulf you know the, mm. the operation iraqi freedom the, the military didn't fend the urban terrain and so yeah. again they allowed themselves to be targeted which is i'm not saying that joint combined arms maneuver is not the most powerful form of battle mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. arguably but it all matters on what is the mission so when people get over offense and over enemy focus, and then like, okay, you know, use a case study, right? Case studies are the best. Mm, Take mm. Ukraine. Ukraine needed to prevent Russia from achieving its goals. You don't go out and fight a bigger military if you're smaller, or if you just know that the Russian, your enemy strategy is terrain based. It mm. has to get to the terrain and take it and mm. hold it. Yeah, but like you said, you want to know about today. Today we are in this transition where you know, you can't just let Russia stay where it's at and hold what it's got. The goal, the Ukrainian stated objective was survival, mm. and now it's kick all Russian military forces out of Ukraine. Mm. That doesn't mean you have to destroy them all. You can get them to culminate to get the Russian military to culminate in Ukraine and have to can no longer go on the offense and they can no longer hold in the positions they have. Mm. If this is true, what's about to happen in Harrison, and Ukrainians are able to achieve their first offensive win, as in they went on the offense and took back terrain that had been mm. seized, they would then have the initiative, at least in that area, right? Because mm. there mm. are two fronts, right? There is the, the eastern front and the southern front, clearly, in this war. Um, that's where we stand. It's really you know touch or go at this point on because 
you know, your enemy always gets a vote. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Ukraine was achieving some really important setting conditions in Harrison, like taking out the bridges, taking out the logistical lines, mm -hmm. taking out ammunition dumps, but your enemy gets a vote. So Russia does have the ability to reinforce the Southern front, mm -hmm. which could be the goal that we don't know. If you feared losing all of the uh, Donbass rapidly, well, one way to stop that from happening, kind of like Mariupol defending till the end, caused the Russian military not to be able to advance on places like Zaporizhia and other, yeah. yeah, multiple fronts. This is war, right? So it's really hard to to know without knowing the operational plans of both sides. But we can make some strong, like when there's a battlefield victory, we should call it that, right? Mm -hmm. The Battle mm -hmm. of Kiev was a massive historic victory for a small smaller i know ukraine as a country is not small but a smaller mm -hmm. force yeah achieving a big victory on a the second largest military in the world and before we get to kiev which i think is uh, is a really important piece but why is that why is kherson so important and there is there are specific reasons and i think uh even in the past i've spoken to people like mike martin about the kind of uh potential uh uh that it was almost a, a fame to to give the world an impression that ukraine is really really fighting for the Donbass, but it was almost a, it was almost a false narrative. There was a false expectation of its importance, or, or of course it's important, but compared to uh, kind of southern front. What's your view on the importance of Kherson? So I think Kherson is important at the strategic level more than it is at the tactical level, mm. right? Tactically, kind of like the Donbass, like tactically, of course, every inch of Ukrainian land is important to Ukraine, mm, of course. So this gets to the kind of the diplomatic form of power, mm. right? How has Ukraine mobilized 50 nations in support mm. of, of their goals? One, they had to prove themselves as a democracy and that they were willing to fight for their country. And I, and I think had the, you know, the government fled in the first week, had they not fought, they wouldn't have mm. 50 nations in their support. You know, this is three dimensional chess in diplomatic terms, right? Mm. Every country making a decision on joining Ukraine and providing Ukraine with whatever it is. Um, even if it's just backing. Kherson is a very important moment where, again, Ukraine has to, you know, they, of course, tactically want to regain ground to make an a impact on Russia's narrative of their successes in Ukraine, mm. but also show the value of the support they have gotten to this point because mm. they, their victories have been strongly wedded to the technologies, right? They're asking yeah. for arms, not actual troops helping them. But you have to be able to show all these 50 nations and, and to maintain this you know, arsenal of the democracy, this coalition of democracies. This, if Hirasan works, you gain the, the initiative, that, that support continues and that support may grow. And like, mm -hmm. as you have to look at every country's goal in this war, right? This is a war for, of course, Ukraine, but this is a war about weakening Russia in all its forms of power, which it is. It's every day it stays in the country, it gets weaker. Yeah. So if you can hit it at their military strength, right? Because militarily, after they lost that battle, in this new state of goal, they looked very strong. Mm. You can take Harris on, you put a big crack in that that narrative. As they really have, they're in a bit of chaos mode on just manpower reinforcements, mm. right? On mm. getting people so that every win, of course... For, is great for Ukraine, but it's also a loss for Russia's on in all forms of those powers, right? As they mm, get mm, weaker mm. and weaker to say that this is their goal. If the Southern front starts to crumble, then you could see another phase having to be started by Russia, right? They control the information in Russia, but you could say like, okay, we didn't want, you know, we've always yeah. said this is about the Donbass, right? We yeah. didn't want Harrison. Yeah. You know, we, we'll withdraw always, from uh, Harrison yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, so, this is about regaining the initiative after April of 2022, when the war started, the war had been won for Ukraine. Mm. The Ukrainians started to lose initiative though, right? They started to lose ground. They started to very rapidly lose some tactical fights, like you said, trading mm. space mm. for time. If you were to turn that now with this increase in MLRS, this increase in all the munitions, you regain the, the initiative and if you can get the enemy to make enough mistakes, that initiative will just continue to build, right? The momentum mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, and right, then you yeah. can see, do you see Zaporizhia falling? Do you see, mm -hmm. you know, these, do you see the the encirclement of Russian forces start happening? We're a long way from that, but every win matters, right? So mm -hmm. each one builds up. You, you say we're a long way away from that. 
What's your thoughts on the European winter? It's effectively around the corner. I mean, we're talking three months really before, you know, the cold weather starts setting in at least. And that's definitely going to have a change in operations for both Ukraine and Russia. No, for sure. Um, and that's what we saw even in the beginning. One, terrain matters, right? And yeah. urban terrain yeah. really yeah. matters. Yeah. But weather matters. Weather has an impact on all weapon systems, on on troop morale, everything. I would say it will impact both sides, clearly. I say I think it will impact Russians more mm. Mm. just based on their what they've shown on their maintenance and logistical capabilities. And it the like I said, every day that this continues to go on, I think Ukrainians get stronger as in their formations that they feel, mm. the training they receive, and the weapons they are yeah. able to get to the front lines, and Russia gets weaker. So winter will weaken Russia, in my my thoughts. Now, the fear is that if you let winter come, could this slow down, and mm. the momentum of Ukraine slow down? That is a real fear. I have been adamant, and maybe nobody can tell you for sure, but this is not the way war works. You can't mm. predict things happening that well. I think this war is a months, not years. Mm. Other people have argued this is a years long. This is a long war. Like, look, yeah, long as Putin's in power, of course he's going to fight mm. for Ukraine. But his military that he has fielded in Ukraine can only do so much. Mm. It can be pushed to culmination. Yeah, because it, he can't mobilize all of Russia for a fight that's not an existential threat. Mm. Mm. What are your thoughts on the idea that? Uh, Putin's working towards a frozen conflict, that this is a strategic success for him in many ways, that, you know, he's taken uh, a fair bit of uh, territory, you know, east and south, uh, he's kind of joined east and south and still still is connected to freeze it uh, effectively, which is something he's done in the past, you know, where he'd, you know, take a bit of ground, uh, make it contested, uh, and then over time start building Russianizing, I guess, the entire population, which we know he's doing in the Donbass, is you know installing people that are favorable to Russia. Of course, we know about Crimea. Uh, we've heard the same already happening in Mariupol. So, what are your thoughts on that as a strategy? Yeah, I think that. So, one to think that every strategic assessment mm. Russia has has lost, mm. even it's of all its forms of power, right? Dime it is lost significantly on every level. And, you know, insert any country, in, in Ukraine especially, the world saw that its military is weaker than we all believed it was. Mm. You know, not to take too many assessments from it, but having visited Ukraine, so mm. Ukraine's not the Ukraine of 2014. It isn't the Ukraine that lost Crimea and then the, the war was frozen for a little while. From my assessment of Ukraine is that they won't stop fighting anytime soon. Mm. You know, this whole the sue for peace thing is not a, not an option. You know, the things that have been done to the Ukrainian people, mm. in, in not just in Bucha, but across Ukraine, mm. Mm. they're going to fight every day. So they're, they're not just going to stop fighting. Of course, all war ends with a political settlement. Mm. But I don't see, there's no political government or population or generation of people in Ukraine at this moment, after what's happened, who's going to say, okay, yes, I agree with you. We should sue for peace. Mm. And then, mm. you know. Everything that's taken, you know, no, I, I just don't see that as a, a any variable. Yes, if you were to talk to me in 2013, mm. maybe that that's not the Ukraine. Ukraine, much like any starting countries of democracies, its generations and its populations are different because of this war. Mm. So Putin miscalculated Ukrainians for sure mm. uh, in every level, but. To put that kind of thought process on where this goes and that Putin could say, you know, strategically, he's liberated these areas in that narrative, right? He hasn't, mm. he hasn't liberated crap. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that narrative that, that anybody's going to settle for that, not the Ukrainians. And like I said, Russia has to fight the military it has. Mm. Ukraine has hundreds of thousands of fighters that aren't trained yet. But they're they're getting trained, mm, mm, mm. and so even where we think they're weaker, they're growing in power, in fighting capability, and morale, motivation, and weapons, and and tens of thousands of people being trained mm. by other countries outside of Ukraine. Ukraine today is not Ukraine of even two years ago, mm, and mm, I mm. honestly believe that Putin will go down as the worst nation state leader in modern era because of the strategic blunders he's caused mm. for his mm. nation as a nation. 
So you, let alone what he's doing to, to Ukraine, but as a nation, if you just put Russia yeah. on the table, he has made so many strategic blunders. He's going to go down in history, all right. Mm, but just as mm. the dumbest decisions, uh, and he can make a decision any moment to. It's not like he needs to save face. So I don't like that narrative either. That mm, you know, Putin mm, needs to save face. Mm, mm. He controls all information. He's built for decades the yeah. ability to anything he says is true. Yeah. So if he says that we won in Ukraine and we've ended our special military operation, he could do it. That's the dangerous path, I guess, is that there are such a there's a contest of narratives. You know, ultimately, narratives also. You know, it is part of the information war, uh, and information war is part of you know the battle, uh, which we absolutely can't forget. You made the point that you've been to Ukraine. I think it was a month or two months ago, and you made the strong point about what you saw on the ground from the people. Uh, and I think one of the things that we need to recognize, as an ethnic Bosnian born in Sarajevo, I can I can relate to this. You can't kill a people, and that's what uh, what we've seen here. We've seen the birth, truly the birth of the Ukrainian identity and Ukraine as a nation state. From your perspective, what you saw on the ground, what was the morale like and how important is that, not just in this war, but just in war in general? And what does it show us about the actual human component or or the importance of the human component in war? Yeah, so if, I mean, I guess if people need a reminding of that war, war has, we say is in teaching this, has an enduring nature and it has an ever-changing character. Mm-hmm. The enduring nature is that is it's human, right? It, it's humans at the forefront. It's not weapons and technologies mm-hmm. and killing. War is a political act by humans. Um, I like your your idea about killing a people, and I'd push that. It's really hard to kill an idea mm-hmm. and really hard to, to kill a form of government, which if you understand the history of Ukraine, mm-hmm. the idea of the people, right, the, the values and, and all that. So I went to Ukraine in in June, but as a a researcher to study just the Battle of Kiev, Mm. because it was, in my opinion, the most decisive battle in modern history with a strategic result, right? It made Russia fail in regime change. Um, It was the defense of the city. So I went to see how that city was defended and defeated Russian attackers. If you want to uh, zero in on that now, then maybe, and then we'll come back to the human piece, because I think this Battle of Kiev really will set the scene as well. And given how intimately you're familiar with it, I think it's important. So what what was it about the Battle of Kiev that that makes it as unique as you describe it? Sure. So one is it's on account, almost counter narrative to what is success in war, right? So the, one of the common narratives now is that if you're offensively based combined arms maneuver, that's the, the surest path to victory in, in all around the world. Mm. And that's just ridiculous because Ukraine needed to defend its terrain from an invading force. It mm. needed to prevent Russia from getting inside Kiev and taking the form of government, to taking out Zelensky and his government. Mm. Mm. It didn't need to encircle the city. It didn't need to clear the city of 3 million people. It just needed to get inside of it and raise the Russian flag on top of the government and say, Russia, Ukraine is now Russia. R- mm. Ukraine mm. doesn't mm. exist. Even yeah. if you would have forced the government into exile, it wouldn't have, yeah. you know, it didn't matter. You held the ground, yeah. You held the ground. You were in the capital of, you know, now this Russian territory. So that's why that, and the only way you did that was to defend, successfully defend the terrain. And what's really interesting about the Battle of Kiev, and I'll, as I continue to write about it, is that it was, you know, it was an area of defense, right? Area of defense is, is about terrain. They wanted to prevent Russia from getting inside of it. Uh, and Russia came some people argue with a false belief that they could do a, you know, you know, market garden mm. operation, Iraqi freedom, you know, type of rapid invasion, relying on speed and air power to take down cognitively your enemy. So there are some misconceptions. So we're trying not to stick the whole interview up, but what mm. Ukraine did one, there was a political decision for the Ukrainian military not to be in the defensive positions. Mm. There's some history to that, but basically the the one brigade who was assigned to defend the terrain, right? Because Ukraine had most of its military in mm. eastern Ukraine, in mm. the Donbass, where they've been fighting for a long time. And they had formations in all the cities, but it wasn't massive Sizable, amounts of forces, yeah. right? Yeah. So mm. they had one brigade and some other forces, but one brigade in the city who was told you cannot be out in defensive positions, which might have arguably saved them, right? Because mm. if you're invading a country and invading a 
is shitty. You want to, you'll strike anything you can see well before you get there with air power, with mm. long range munitions. Well, the Ukrainian military wasn't out on February 24th, so there was nothing to hit. Mm. So some of the That's stuff got hit, but not That's like, very yeah. interesting, yeah. And also, I mean, if we combine that with the narrative of even Zelensky, you know, up until D Day, you know, yep. he was almost, uh, well, at least that's part of, that was part of the narrative, even screaming at the West, hey, stop building this up. You know, we're not about to get invaded, uh, which uh, which is history will undoubtedly show us that there was a, there was a master, master stroke strategically. Yeah. Sorry, go. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And, but clearly planning had been done, right? So mm. even though they weren't in defensive positions, clearly there had been a lot of planning, probably with Western help, but let's give them full credit. And if it came down, worst case scenario, how could we defend and keep? So what I saw was one, you know, the, the Russian military did create what's called a joint forcible entry. It did insert over 20 helicopters into an airfield, hostile airfield, mm -hmm. which is classic rapid city taking, right? You take yeah. an airfield, you yeah, build an, an air bridge. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you start, yeah, you bring. So they, the Russians executed that. They got 20 plus air of a uh, very... Uh, the VDV, the Airborne and Special Forces, and they got in there, right? CNN's interviewing them on the 25 February, right? Uh, but the problem, and then they they drove with rapid force, multiple mechanized formations driving in from Belarus on two avenues of approach. Mm -hmm. But then you had other formations driving on Cherniv and Sumy and Kharkiv, other places. So they, they kind of, they spread themselves thin. But the main attack of Kiev you know, they tried to seize this airfield, and they did. A little luck for the Ukrainians that there was also a National Guard unit stationed at the airfield mm. who wasn't there, but a lot of their forces was to include their artillery. Mm. So the Russians get this these 20 helicopters, seize the air lodgement, but they didn't bring enough to seize it with what, right? Because usually you combine that with holding... Mm. For long enough to get... Uh, yeah. yeah, so you have air being... Land, you, the air bridge set up, and you have air air coming in with more reinforcements well once you can contest the air with oh let's say man pads like stingers mm. and other capabilities it's going to be really hard to bring in thing even if you got your helicopters in uh, low level altitudes and things like that you know mm. using surprise so what happens is that the, the airfield gets attacked by artillery and ukrainian special forces and the initial people that came in get eliminated mm. and really there's a little bit of luck here but those forces that were dropped into this airfield, and it wasn't the only airfield they tried to see, you know, they basically struck or tried to, to use. Mm. It was the main one, but the forces that landed get eliminated, and then the airfield becomes unusable. So when the mechanized forces show up, oh, about 10 hours too late, <laughs> they, they reoccupy the airfield, but it can still not be used as an air, mm. air lodgement. So then what you have is these mounted formations just not encircling the city, but trying to find a way in. Who are the backups, mm. right? The, the mechanized push, the penetration. Mm. So they had mm -hmm. to penetrate Kiev. What happened was, and this is the beauty, again, of, of the Ukrainian planning, is they blew all their bridges, mm. just about all of them, hundreds of them. They raised the water level of, of three rivers. So the, you, they used the urban infrastructure to the to build a porcupine defense. Mm, mm. A moat, so, effectively, around the castle, yeah, right? It's, a castle. It's, it's so I actually incredible. say yeah. they, they closed the castle gates. Yeah, Kiev, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is actually, it's an ancient fortress city. I mean, it's if you understand why cities are built. So I was fascinated by that. And, mm, and, and mm, every mm. bridge we went to visit were... But then there were, you know, you still... This is a heavy mechanized... Russian formation that's coming your way. Mm. But now most of the routes are gone that they thought they were going to use. They had old maps. The Ukrainians spray painted or took down all signs. All the signs, which was, yeah. yeah. I mean, geez, yeah. Which just... I, I I had heard about but until I saw it. Like, no, no, all the signs. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. So now you have Russian formations driving in. Now all the roads are, all the bridges are blocked. The rivers have been raised. So all the marshy lands. Now you have to, there's rivers in your way. And then there's only a few ways left in, and it is the Ukrainian civilians that come out to fight. So if, if people have this idea about Red Dawn, this is beyond Red Dawn. This is Ukrainian civilians, many who had prior military service from 2014 on, who just said, what, Russians are here? And they grabbed either weapons in their communities or, again, this goes to planning, 18 to 20,000 AK 47s were distributed in the Kyiv region by the government. They literally were handing out 
one AK-47 and two magazines telling people to go out and fight. So now you had like a few roads left over. And this is what happened. Like in Bucha, it, there's one bridge leading from Bucha to Arpin. It's left open on purpose. Russian formation drives into it and just, just gets decimated. You know, just tens and tens of vehicles just decimated like uh, within days. You know, this is the first couple of days. So they, they created what's called a basically a defense in depth. But the battles are happening on the peri-urban by Ukrainian civilians because the, the military is using their limited resources on whatever, you know, like artillery on Hostomel, like artillery in the, that ambush in Bucha, or when they try to push into Mashoun, or when they push into Brovary, so that you, you almost have this command cell deep in the city, likely underground, because there's a lot of underground in Kiev, who are allocating just a few resources they have to create this massive block. And the, and the thing about defenses is people in my community say, you know, urban defenses never win, right? So usually the defender loses historically. But I, I call that, I say bullocks. It's how long do you want somebody to defend for? Kiev didn't have to defend indefinitely. Kiev just had to defend long enough for what was sent at it to be destroyed or to culminate, Right. That's what happened. Russian forces attacking Kiev culminated when they couldn't get in because they thought they were going to do a rapid takedown. It would only last three days. I honestly believe that they thought it would only last three days. So that now you have their logistical supplies being hit, railroad heads being hit, logistical convoys getting stuck. So the formations that didn't make it into the Kiev Oblast mm. are starting to get cut off, mm, mm. running out of supplies, running out of uh, the commo. The, they can't talk to each other running out of gas. It just becomes a nightmare for them. Mm, mm. And eventually, because there's all these other battles going on all around Ukraine, there's no reinforcements to be sent. Mm. So you, they culminate. And, and no path was, to send them through no <laughs> because path, you haven't secured right? either the air bridge or the land bridge. Yeah. And there's a couple, there is a one, like this is a breakthrough in the East and Bavaria where this, these forces that are stuck get ordered, like you will push and you will drive down the main road. And this is this famous like column and parade that we mm, we see in mm. in Bavaria and Skyburn that just comes down the road and runs into a complex anti armor ambush of the Ukrainian military and then hundreds of civilians. So I really think this element of the volunteers, right? So on paper it was one brigade. In reality, it was tens of thousands of Ukrainians. In reality, it was a nation. Yeah, it was a nation, right? Yeah. And this is yeah. the point of the nation rose up. You have mm. you know stories of grandpas. And father son RPG teams, mm, mm. and then the other aspect is about the the weapons. You know, the, when Russia inserted itself in Ukraine, just like in urban environments, as soon as you touch it, you change it. Mm. They changed Ukraine as soon as they inserted themselves into it, even militarily. Because the well, the first thing that the Ukrainians did when they destroyed something is they ran up and took everything they could. Mm. So I ran into all kinds of Ukrainian civilians with with high speed or like sophisticated Russian weapons. Well, there's a lot of farmers with tanks, right? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so this is this amazing defense that happens, right? The, a classic area defense, defense in deep, using the infrastructure and then capitalizing on the civilians, right? And I don't like civilians in combat. Mm. Nobody does. And once a civilian picks up an arm, you know, a weapon, it's no longer a civilian, right? It's mm. a combatant. So, but this is what, these are the decisions that Ukraine made in like 24 hours. They instituted martial law, right? So any adult male from 18 to 60 had to stay in the country and was told to go out and resist. And then, and they did, they created the territorial defense of Ukraine. So of the foreign legion mm -hmm. where any mm -hmm. volunteer, any foreign volunteer could come into Ukraine um, mm -hmm. and legally have a legal framework in which to join the fight under the Ukrainian army. Mm -hmm. Which makes mm. it so that some of the things that Russia's done, but they mm. made these massive decisions, like within 24 hours, that are really part of the story on how they defeated Russia from achieving its goal of overtaking Ukraine. Yeah, again, as, a, as someone from Sarajevo, you know, I get my heart starts beating faster because I remember the stories of the defenders of the city, and it was people, it was students, it was uh, men and women who have some understanding of. The military because of the compulsory military service uh, throughout Yugoslavia at the time and and that's what this kind of idea of the territorial defense uh, you know you you're running up against tanks uh, with you know Molotov cocktails uh, etc which I think uh, uh, in the case of Ukraine uh, in no small part due to your uh, manual as well uh, which is uh, which is interesting and I, and I do want to get to it but I think this is where we can zero in on this on this idea of, of human because 
you know, and, and I just want to double tap that on this. You can't kill a people because we've seen a nation born, a people born. Is this something that we don't, we in the West, I mean, don't necessarily, in the Western militaries at least, don't necessarily pay enough attention to? And I say this because we we, we talk about this kind of all-domain, multi-domain warfare. We've got, you know, air, sea, land, cyber, uh, and space domains, which is where we, you know, fight within and through. But we don't really have a human domain, at least not doctrinally. It's not something that we doctrinally, I don't want to say study because many people do, but we don't have it as, a, as our kind of building blocks, I guess, in how we conduct warfare. We're very technological or, or technical, at least in my my humble view, uh, in how we approach warfare. We're seeing time and time again that, you know, while well, Ukraine proves it, the human domain, the human mind has shifted all of that. I mean, on paper, Russia had this sewn up. On paper, no question. You know, a brigade defending, well, how big is uh, Kiev? Three million? Yep. Right? That's a, you know, for anybody who understands scale, that's that, that's nothing. I mean, it really is nothing. I mean, the city of three million has so many access points uh, that you can't, you cannot shift your forces fast enough if, if the, you know, if a threat large enough is, is coming. Uh, so what's your thoughts on that? What What's your thoughts on this idea of the human domain and that becoming more of a, an embedded thinking principle in how war is conducted? Yeah. So it's a great question, right? So one of the, you know, I don't always like to to, to quote Clausewitz, right? Because mm. within our communities, it kind of gets- He's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. People quote it, don't really mm. read it. Um, there's probably a reason for that though as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason. Mm. And I think it, you people want simple things to understand complex things. One of the things he used to say was you have to understand the war you're in. Mm. So the the human domain has always been a part of, of war, even of modern war, but- you have to understand on the war we're fighting. There, these are existential wars for survival. Mm. And there is a little bit of, we call it counterinsurgency hangover, right? So we know in counterinsurgencies, the people is the objective, mm, right? Mm. You can only survive in an insurgency through hiding within the population, all of this. Um, there has been older research and lots of lines of research in what's called total resistance or total defense. Mm. So, but like you know from from places in history, this ideal that the nation is going to fight doesn't, hasn't always played out in history. Mm. There is usually a military component to it. And this is the military analysis that people do on just militaries on paper that shouldn't do well. And discounting one, the urban nature, but also urban as people is what is the people factor in wars that are going to prevent or change the, the strategic outcomes. Mm. It, it all gets pretty back to me. Tell me the war we're talking about. Tell mm. me the strategic goals of both sides. Because it could be a limited objective war. Not a low intensity conflict, but a limited objective. And then is there, where were the human element rate on the overall achievement of the objectives? Because like you said, the human element could just be in the cognitive domain. Mm. In this is the Russia miscalculated the cognitive domain and thought that they would be welcomed as liberators mm, mm, of, mm. Of, of fellow cousin Russians. You know, that's just a complete either hubris, ignorance, you know, not understanding what Ukraine had become, had always been, you know, all this stuff. I think that's important. I think that's important yeah. what Ukraine has become, right? Because yes. it, history had taught Putin that this can be done. You yeah. know, Donbass, Crimea, you know, the West kind of just we stood by and and yes, we armed and armed, but it wasn't really until, like you said, what Ukraine had become. I think that's a that's again, that's part of that human piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, and this is why we teach us in you know war college and things like that. This stuff is hard, right? Strategic mm, studies. Mm, I mean, mm. you have to have an understanding of people, economics, infrastructure, terrain, the disciplines you have to to study to understand war are very large. Mm, mm, but to yeah. understand Ukraine's population, it's generational aspects of who's doing the fighting. If you understand the the Orange Revolution and the Maidan, you get to a different picture where, mm. but I still say, even having, if you, you were an Ukrainian expert, you know, like sitting in the United States, sometimes war is the greatest test, mm, right? It's the mm. greatest test of what you think you can do, but also in the idea. And that's why I think that Ukraine had to show that it wanted democracy. Mm. It had to show that it was going to fight for its way of life. Like you said, it's hard to kill a people, 
but these are ideals, right? This is mm-hmm. an ideal within a culture and a generation. Mm-hmm. So some people say, you know, like, yo, these are just stronger, you know, warrior class or stronger fighting people. Like, yes, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I can see where you could lead yourself to a very quick war if you're Russia, if you didn't understand the possibility of a complete citizen defense mm, mm. a complete citizen uprising that now your your small military just turned into a much bigger yeah. military but then like like we've been talking about that was one small piece of the pie right ukrainians had to fight and show they wanted to fight for this this global ideal of mm. democracies living free human rights all these things to gain the support of 50 other nations mm, mm. And we even forget this in American history. Like if we Americans had not revolted to the British rule, it, we would not have gotten France to help us. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way, like we kind of forget the France part about somebody coming to our aid. Mm-hmm. We would not be here today had we not, one, shown that we were willing to fight for our idea, what we wanted to live in. But then to gain that external help by showing that we're willing to fight and die for it. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting piece because I think we've seen something very opposite, or at least we've judged it as that in Afghanistan. And again, very recently, only you know it was the first anniversary of, of the fall of Afghanistan, uh, of where course, you know yeah. Afghanistan Afghans were accused of not standing up for their nation. Uh, but again, I think that comes down to not understanding the human domain because you know what we thought was Afghanistan or what the idea of Afghanistan was was vastly different to what many Afghans thought or had the opportunity to think. Outside of Kabul, at least, and I think that's a that's a really, again, interesting comparison between you know how Absolutely. the concept of a nation is not as strong everywhere as it is in Ukraine. And again, this takes me to to a point that we've touched on earlier, and that's the power of information and information warfare. Undoubtedly, at least to the West, the information operations by Ukraine are just. I mean, I'm sure PhDs and textbooks will be written on the execution. But in your view, and especially given your book, Connected Soldiers, where you talk about this this idea of connectivity between uh, a fighting force and its cohesion, how have you seen this reflected in Ukraine, especially, I guess, maybe even at the start of the the Battle of Kiev and now uh, kind of in a a more enduring uh, nature? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, more quotes for you. But I think, again, information warfare or the information domain always has to look through the prism of the objective. Mm. War is a battle of wills. Now, Clausewitz said it was the wills, you know, posing your will on the enemy. Mm. I argue that it's just a battle of wills. That means in multiple populations and that battle of wills, so the will of your enemy, you can achieve like, you know, a cognitive win and they just surrender. You know, that can be through force or through the threat of force or just from the situation around them. Mm -hmm. But then like we've been talking about, you have the will of the globe in, in this case to support one fighting force you know, with whatever it is that they're willing to s- support, right? This is the will of mm, the three populations, mm. the military, the politics, and the populations. Where the modern technology or the connected soldier comes into place is that there's, unlike any other time in human history, we're more connected than we, you know, mm, mm, mm. every aspect that matters in war, right? From tactics, from being able to, you know, tap into a cell phone camera, or fly a little commercial drone and I can see you. Mm. So you're the enemy's ability to surprise, which Sun Tzu said it was the most important element of warfare is intelligence and the ability to surprise somebody. Mm, mm, well, how mm. do you do that on a modern battlefield when I can see everything from, from millions the sky of eyes. Yeah. and millions of eyes from satellites to, to highway cameras. But in the information domain is this, this ability to see into it. I don't have to listen to what somebody's telling me. I, I can watch war happening in real time. Yeah. I can see videos of war, you know, battles being won. I can see videos of atrocities happening. And then that influences people's will either to continue fighting, to support a fight, or to stop fighting. I'm sure we'll talk about, but information technology also, when you understand the human element is more important than any weapon, then the morale, cohesion, and motivation of people to fight, not just soldiers, but people like mm. we're talking about citizens if you can now talk to them directly in mass unlike you've ever been able to in history then you can influence their will to fight and this is i think this does get to president Zelensky, 
stories that some of these stories like snake island or mm, mm. boats by the like, existence I, I need a i need ammo i don't need a ride mm, yeah those are more powerful than any bullet that's ever been created mm. because it's hitting the mind it's hitting the the will of people to fight and when you lose it like russia has then there's no more fighting when you when people lose the will to fight Mm, yeah, absolutely, and I think that's a again, it's it's one of example of some of the sh- short snippets, you know, the sound bites that that <laughs> that captured the world. Um, and I think the well, at least when I, when I say the world, West, I mean I had Carl Miller on pod as well not long ago, uh, who looked at you know the narratives, Russian narratives in the BRICS countries, which is it's it's not as uh, it's not as clear as to who's winning the information war in in some of the non-Western nations, uh, and that's still a contested space, but certainly in the West. Uh, which for Ukraine mattered because the weapons uh, reinforcements uh, are coming from the West, uh, which is obviously to its West. So it, it really played into this. And you could see it on social media in particular, the kind of international support for Ukraine's resistance was growing by the minute. And Zelensky at the front with some of those kind of quotes uh, just had a huge, huge role to play. But also your book if I, or your your manual it plays a part in this because I think this is where we're talking about technology and connectivity and I guess the information age or the internet. If I'm correct, the mini manual for the Urban Defender was was kind of born on Twitter. Did I read that right or hear that right? Absolutely, 100%. Tell us a little bit about how that how that happened and, and its impact as well. I mean, it, it is used on the battlefield right now. Yeah, so war, yeah, war is all about timing. So because I was able to watch the war in real time, right? So I could mm. watch a live feed in mm. Kiev. I, yeah. We all could watch Russian, you know, the CNN guy interviewing a Russian paratrooper on the day of the invasion. You know, there's been television wars in the past. There's even been, you know, some people would argue TikTok wars or mm. Twitter wars, but this is the first like full out social media war, mm. I think, in history. And my my small vignette is an example of that. So me having studied urban warfare for a little while, Watching the war unfold on February 24th, then I started to see things like Russians rushing through urban areas uncontested. They're just Mm -hmm. driving through areas. And then I was hearing Ukrainian government officials on radio broadcast saying, go out and resist. Mm -hmm. And that was it. It was just, that was the message, go out and resist. And then there's another message saying, make Molotov cocktails, go out and resist. So through Twitter, I was seeing this. And then I, so I said, oh, let me put out one tweet, you know, a longer threaded tweet saying if I was, you know, John Spencer, just a private citizen who had studied urban warfare, if I was in any of these cities, here are the things that I would do. Mm. So I put out a tweet saying I would I would block all roads, I would park trucks in the roads. You know, sometimes war is literally just stopping somebody from going where mm. they want to go. And in the invasion, it was a lot about that. You know, I would never be standing in the open because I can you could be bombed. I would mm. use concrete, I would I would attack from the second story floors and I would build tank ditches. And you know, I, I put out a list of things that I would do to defend. And you know, mm. defense is a very specific thing. Well, that tweet went viral, that one tweet, and got seen by millions of people, mm. you know, and a great majority in Ukraine. As I watched the war unfold, I started seeing more things like people like filling sandbags and like so I started putting out images through tweets of uh, do this, not that. And like mm. some of it's my history too. As a soldier, I know that people under stress who know nothing about the military need very clear instructions, mm. right? Rather than just go out and resist, like go out and block every road that you physically can. Mm. And then stick, you know, be in groups because you need it. So I started putting out a series of tweets. Mm. And then eventually mm. the way that Twitter works, people started like, I can't see your tweeting anymore just because it, you know, the thread. Mm, mm, that's right. So yeah. The first version of the mini manual for the Urban Defender was literally just you know, a series of 20 tweets put into a PDF and posted online. Mm. Well, every day I, you know, as I was watching and getting feedback from being able to watch the war, yeah. and be able to watch the fighting, I was able to put more in there. And then at one point, the Ukrainian military, again, somehow watching my tweets, I guess. The uh, the government took my tweets and put mm. them out on their website for resistors. Mm. So taking, and then eventually the manual they started printing off my manual as I put up version two, version yeah. three. So the Ukrainian Department of Defense is printing off versions of my manuals, and you start seeing it everywhere. Mm. And then the, really the culmination was a Ukrainian publisher because of course it was translated into Ukrainian. Yeah asked for my permission to print off a hundred thousand copies of it. And I said, of course, mm. I'm not making any, 
Yeah, mm. I never, I don't make any money off of it. Mm, mm, mm. And it was it was in Mariupol. It was in I mean, just a humbling experience because even military people then this is the kind of switch is like it was four civilians, right? It was four civilians mm. who were being told to resist. And then you did see the environment start to change. You start to see buses parked in the road. You start to see people not standing in the open. Um, you start to see people attacking from higher levels of the urban train and you know, creating the meat grinder and the porcupine. Mm-hmm. And then it started becoming for the military as even military people don't study urban warfare. So there's elements of historical urban analysis that I've studied and I've even published on like how to defend the like tactics to defend a city, you know, snipers, obstacles, mm-hmm. underground, th- these elements that people just don't know, even mm-hmm. if you're in the mm-hmm. military. Yeah. So then I started evolving it even. So then the military, like I have all these pictures of Ukrainian army person on the front line reading through my manual. So it's really humbling. But mm. back to your question, this is how a guy who's not in the war, you know, thousands of miles away can go, hey, I got a few ideals mm. that might help you. Mm. And somebody not only listened, but then it, it circulated. It went yeah. viral. That's the impact of the world's ability to help in a war. Which is an evolution of this kind of, I mean, traditionally it was known as, you know, CNN factor. When I first joined the military, we studied, yeah. you know, the CNN factor, you know, I think it was Gulf One, where it was the first time we had war live in our living rooms. This is an evolution. This is no longer just on receive. This is now actively participating, you know, from our living rooms. And, you know, in your case, it's to a pretty high extent, but also everybody else who is merely commentating or sharing or retweeting. So all of those people that retweeted your tweets, you know, became, you know, part of the part of the war in many ways from their lounge rooms or, you know, just while they're on the bus checking their uh, their Twitter feed. Now we're talking about a global people that are fighting this war, which is really something rather unique uh, for Ukraine, I think. What are some of the principal lessons, even from this point of, of information warfare, that you think we need to take away from this? Yeah, I, I think... What's interesting about the manual is it's now been translated into 14 different languages. Yeah, it's just from amazing. From Arabic to Chinese to... So you, you know better. Double you sword. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's been other attempts at creating a total defense manual, right? Manuals for civilians. You know, this ideal of territorial defense, is, which will come out of Ukraine. But for me, it's this idea of... You know, if, you could, if your plan for a smaller country is total defense, everybody's going to mm. go out and resist... Mm then you can do things and create products and create training that will help that person you want to go out and Mm. fight. So you you think about, there's plenty of places around the world who will face this existential threat from a very, what seems like a massive military force that if Mm. you were, it's not about defending indefinitely. It's about defending for a certain amount of time to, for the world to respond, right? We're a global community. Mm. So, and this is what happened in Ukraine. They held for long enough for the world to to come help, mm. not save them. You know, they're still fighting for themselves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, I think this element I, for me, as I look, there's an old Swedish one, especially coming out of World War II, and there were these ideals about total defense, mm. Mm. which is different than I think some people have forgotten about, because total resistance is where you have occupied areas, and there's people within the occupied areas resisting. Mm. And in a lot of like special communities that that work in that, I think the big lesson here is that total defense can work, mm. but you have to set the conditions beforehand, right? Because just telling people mm. to go out and resist without a weapon, yeah, you just yeah, without veterans, without training, without instructional manuals, kind of photo, yeah, yeah, without connection, right? So this um, you can't discount the connectivity mm. that has happened in Ukraine, you know, and thank Elon Musk for that. I. I mm. The fact that the Azovstal defenders could communicate till the end mm. is revolutionary. So if that's the idea about total defense, you can set the conditions beforehand. So this uh, this is the huge to me. And, and I actually now is becoming a passion on like, with more time, what would I, if you could give somebody one thing, you know, and that would help and have an impact, what would be the things you would provide to them, right? It's not about how much time do you have, but like if you were to, have to implement total defense tomorrow. Mm. Like what's in place to support that, right? Mm, mm, mm. Then the other aspect, of course, is urban, right? So all the world is more urban. Yeah. You know, this isn't, like you said, this isn't the battlefields of World War II. Russia's shown that you're not going to bypass and avoid any urban area. You're going to have to be able to fight through it at least 
secure your logistical lines, and it most likely will be the you know, tactical, operational, strategic objective. You're not going to win any war by bombing something. Mm, mm. If you want to take it, you got to put people on the ground, take it, and hold it. Mm. That's historical, but people somehow have gotten these fallacies of air dominance and and cognitive you know, wins that you can mm. just bomb your way. Urban is the future. The world is more urban. Countries are more urban. You're going to have to pass through urban. You're going to fight for it. And you're probably going to have to take or defend it. Mm, So mm. hopefully Ukraine helps emphasize that point. And then lastly, so if there's a number three, is that the defense is important. If everybody, like, like, just look at NATO. If everybody in NATO is training for the offense, who's preparing to defend? Mm, mm. It's a little little off. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, please elaborate because that's a, that, I guess that's part of a question that I had for you. I mean, please elaborate yeah. on that point because I think it's an important one. It's the, now it's most powerful, but some people were questioning its worth, but it's a defensive alliance. Mm. Somebody should be preparing to defend while at least buying time. So, because the way to take a country is to rapidly overwhelm it. And if you, if people are preparing for the defense in all war, there is both offense and defense. Mm. But because of the evolutions of the character of warfare, people have really emphasized offense. Like that's that's the right thing to be doing, attacking. Mm, All mm, war mm. has offense and defense. And if you're unprepared for the defense, um, it's going to go really bad for you. And I think also kind of from a culturally, from a military perspective, I think certainly for the Western militaries, we've been expeditionary militaries, you know, for, for a very long time now. We don't really have, and we don't have conscript armies. We don't have compulsory military service by and large. Whereas countries that aren't, you know, even Sweden, you've, you've mentioned Sweden. I mean, I've lived in Sweden for three and a half years. It's incredible. There is, a, a, I mean, it's compulsory, but it's you know sort of voluntary, um, which is which is very Swedish, which I really like. But but there is an idea of uh, you know preparedness, and we were there in Sweden in 2019 when the call came out to make sure you have at least 72 hours of uh, you know food and water, you know supplies. Everybody sh- needs to have that in the house. Uh, which is something that you know we don't think about. Certainly not in Australia. It's it's certainly not not part of our day to day discourse in any sense to think that we might have to defend uh, on our home soil. So I wonder whether that's something that's uh, perhaps even lacking. As unlikely as it is that Australia, uh, you know, much like the US, is about to get invaded, uh, we don't we don't have borders with hostile P or near P adversaries. But is this something that uh, you think is perhaps needed more as a almost as a deterrent as well as an actual defense rather than investing as much as we both our militaries do in the kind of offensive capabilities uh, and a kind of projection of force? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, terrain matters. So if you're surrounded by water, the likelihood of you having to defend urban terrain is not saying it's unlikely, but terrain mm-hmm. matters. Mm-hmm. So I like to prioritize. So I think if you live anywhere in, in Europe, there's a real reality at some point yeah. that you would have to defend cities in general. Mm. And there are things that can be done, like you said, in planning. I mean, even in the actual design of cities in physical infrastructure that can support defending for a certain amount of time. If you're in places like that are along the path to any reasonable expectations. Now, like I said, the United States, Australia, there is an advantage to train and mm. having water borders, right? Water mm-hmm. is a very massive terrain. And um, we used to have coastal guns and all that stuff. I'm not there yet, mm-hmm. but I'm mm-hmm. definitely in a point that no matter what the battle or the war is and where it's at, some people will have to defend for a while by themselves. And, and mm. this, even when you have an alliance, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to defend your terrain for a while while conditions are getting set. Mm-hmm. I think Taiwan, Taiwan's a, a great example of that. Like if, if Taiwan was to fall rapidly, there's nothing that can be done to help. Mm. It, it has to defend for a certain amount of time before yeah. anybody in the international community can do anything. Mm. Even if you're mm. on a ship close by. Mm. And I met you, know, some, the evolution of war has caused some people to forget that. And hopefully people get reminded of that. And, and there are a lot of communities thinking about it now. Thankfully, you know, Ukraine will win this war, in my opinion, hopefully will become a member of NATO soon. And this doesn't continue down this terrible path that Russia is attempting to do, because I do think, which we don't have time to talk about, but 
there is a new book being written about strategic deterrence and, and nuclear weapons. And what does it mean if you're a nuclear armed country? Can you, can you do whatever you want? And there's and all the other rule books that were created before nuclear armed nations were a big thing. Mm. That all these rules were put in place before that, and that's why I'm going to do whatever I want up to a point that I think is in a, a mm. you know. This is what we're dealing with now. So you know, we're dealing with the warper aspect, but there's a very big question that nation states as a whole. Like the only reason that what's happened in Ukraine has happened is mainly because of the you have a, a terrorist with a nuclear bomb. Mm. So what do you mean by new new rules of even? Yeah. So right now we're all playing by the rule book that was created for nation states before nuclear weapons. I mean, it really mm. besides the United States after at the end of World War II the books were being written on on what was acceptable for the world you know the the invasions and the the alliances and the united nations and nato and league of nations it was all before you you had aggressors with nuclear weapons because mm-hmm. that now changes the calculus on what any response mm-hmm. will be mm-hmm. and the global connections right so you know a lot of people wrote these books about you know the global connections with would prevent wars, right? Mm, mm. Because of the, the economic connectivity yeah. and everything. So some people got to go back to the drawing board there, but the strategic one, it's huge because where's the line now in this new rule book of what countries with nuclear weapons can do in the rest of the world will not do anything about it mm, before mm, there are mm. interventions. Like you're sitting, I mean, you know, in, in Sarajevo and Bosnia and Herzegovina, neither side had nuclear weapons. So mm. the rule book of when and who and how would interventions happen were different. And mm. that's why what Ukraine is doing is it's changing the global international order because you have a nuclear armed country in some senses conducting genocide in a mm. country and there's no international community willing to do anything because of the nuclear card. Yeah. If it was happening between two not nuclear armed countries, there were, somebody would have done something by now. Well, well, I guess, I mean, again, as an ethnic Bosnian, I can, uh, you know, push back on that a little bit because, I mean, I, I guess we've seen three and a half years of, of slaughter uh, by, sure. you know, the fifth mightiest military in the world against effectively civilians. And, and many Bosnians even now, there's a lot of, you know, not anguish because they're happy that Ukraine is getting the support that it's getting. Uh, but Bosnia certainly wasn't getting this level of global support. And also when, you know, when we're talking about initiative, when the Bosnians got the initiative and started retaking, recapturing territory, which is perhaps hopefully where Ukraine is now, you know, that's when the world came in and said, okay, enough fighting. But that, again, that's that's perhaps a separate uh, discussion, a separate podcast. But I think the point stands is, is you know, that again, this is about the kind of initiatives and maintenance momentum uh, and morale. And I think we're seeing a very, very different, and I, and I really do believe that it's due a lot to the connectivity. If Bosnia had the same connectivity as Ukraine has, has right now, I think we'd see something very differently because then we would see, you know, the butchers of Bosnia, you know, we'd see the bombing uh, of Sarajevo, we'd seen the bombing of the of the maternity hospital in Sarajevo, of Tuzla going down, of various cities being, you know, be, basically being choked to death. We'd see the the carnage left by 155 uh, millimeter uh, howitzers, et cetera, et cetera. We'd see the people fleeing, you know, and, and I've made this comment on Twitter myself, you know, one of the most emotional things for me seeing was, a, was a, I think it was an eight or nine year old boy crying on a bus crying for his father who stayed behind. And that hit, it resonates with me even right now. It makes me emotional because I was that boy in 1992. So, so those kinds of things have an emotional impact and they galvanize the movement of people you know, globally. And I think you know, this is that kind of idea of the human, connecting the human to human pain, which is why I keep talking about the human domain, which is so, so important. And the connectivity, and I think you know, you've hit the nail on the head time and time again, the connectivity and being able to reach into the battle space and as well, you know, to be reached by the battle space really, really has changed the dynamic, uh, or, you know, of, of today's modern battlefield. And maybe my last question, and I think it ties into to your previous point, in your view, how important is Ukrainian victory in the grand scheme of the kind of current geopolitical tensions? Yeah, I think it's, it's vital I try to stay in my lane of the urban warfare. Sometimes I, I get out of it because <laughs> yeah, of yeah, my yeah. strategic, you know, and my personal thoughts as a citizen. Mm-hmm. I think it's vital from the geopolitical stance, even as our chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff said, is that if Russia's 
able to succeed in Ukraine, it rewrites the global order mm. where a nuclear armed nation can invade and take whatever it wants of a mm. non-nuclear mm. armed nation at will. And it rewrites what is acceptable and not acceptable with nation states. So I think it's vital for Ukraine, of course, to survive, you know, it'll survive as a nation, of mm. course, I, I personally think, mm -hmm. but it needs to win overall for its its new Ukraine. It needs to win for Europe mm. because you have this aggressor who is willing, won't stop at Ukraine. Mm. I mean, I think it needs to win for the world because all the, the luxuries that we have in the United States, the prosperity and all this is only made off the backbone of the global international order mm, from, mm. from economic ties to diplomatic and information ties. Mm. If Russia succeeds, all of that changes. Mm. So mm. that's why I think it's yeah. so critical, the Ukrainian victory. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could agree more. And, and I also think it's a, it, it's hopefully potentially a, a deterrent uh, in also realizing that, uh, and again, I just have to kind of uh, weave in my own views of war here, you know, I think Putin has proven that, you know, war is not the answer here. You're paying a much higher price uh, than you thought. Uh, so hopefully it could also serve as a deterrent for, for other global leaders who think that force and violence and war might solve their geopolitical strategic goals. Of course, I think, uh, you know, that's more often than not a fallacy. But on that note, John, I'm, uh, I'm very humbled uh, that you've agreed to speak. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me so much of your time and, and sharing your, your, your insights so candidly. I know your time is short and uh, you're undoubtedly going to jump on another bunch of interviews uh, you know, over the next couple of hours. So very grateful uh, that you've spoken with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for Don. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Voices of War. And since you got this far, please consider showing your support by liking and reviewing the show wherever you catch your pods. Also, if you're able, please consider showing your support through our Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee page. Links to both are in the show notes. Thank you, and until next time.